Currently, I'm in the middle of a uh, discussion with some colleagues, students, about a sustainable development project. So, again, it's appropriate for this class since it is a global. Uh, this know what this called? Global technology. All right. So uh, we'll go that way. So if you have any questions along the way, feel free to ask because uh, I'm always easily distracted anyway. Just do your best to keep it halfway relevant to <laughs> the topic or, or get better at finding that route and then tangent out. So uh, as far as energy goes, I'm going to give you some, uh, some very brief definitions, very brief discussion on this, and then we'll get to the case at hand, and that's where you guys will um, break into small groups or just one large group and we talk about it. So uh, when we talk about energy, we're generally referring to electrical energy in this discussion. Uh, a good third of the world's energy consumption is transportation fuels, but we're talking about electrical energy. Other energy sources could be or energy uses could be heating. If somebody has a fireplace, cooking, that type of thing. Uh, so it could be that, but for our discussion here, we're gonna talk about electricity and what that can yield. Uh, so basically running motors, lights, heat, and cooling. And, and that pretty well covers the electrical uses you might find anywhere around here. Uh, well, you can throw entertainment in there your Xbox, that kind of thing. But when we talk about sustainable development, we weren't really talking about the PlayStations. All right, so general sources of electricity. Where do we get, what sources produce this for us? Uh, fossil fuels, such as coal, oil, natural gas, all can be burned in that heat, then transfers to water, it boils and transfers to kinetic energy, and then we get motion to power a generator, electricity. Same idea with nuclear. However, instead of using a fossil fuel and burning it, we are using a con controlled nuclear reaction, heating the water. Water creates steam, pressure and motion, turns the generator. Hydropower, uh, this is a picture of the Three Gorges Dam. So hydropower is using stored energy and water. By holding it up, we are now making potential energy. And that potential energy just turns to kinetic energy, which then powers a turbine that creates electricity. Oceanic, uh, or this, this is more of a river. Oceanic could be like waves or tides as they move in and out. If you can control those, then that's a, a form of electricity as well. Biomass would be a wood, firewood. You can <coughs> burn that, burn corn stalks, burn bamboo, burn in just about anything, uh, anything living, you can burn it and control that heat, heat up water, turn the power generator, same idea. The latter two, wind and solar. Wind, uh, as we know it, is, is moving air. So that, that, I, don't, I don't know if I have to define that much more, what wind is, but that's the same idea as these others we've talked about where you have some sort of fluid moving and that fluid dynamics and powers a generator. So instead of having a controlled tube where your steam goes, we're just using the wind. That's why they're much larger because it's much less dense. And solar is another one. So in this case, we're talking about solar as in photovoltaic. Have the photoelectric panels, light hits it, creates a reaction, has a DC current, inverted to the usable alternating current for us. Uh, other sources could be geothermal, take heat from the earth, and that heat creates steam, etc. You're getting an idea, right? So if we, wanted, if we want to power a generator, we have to get something to move. Unless it's solar, which is pretty passive. Kind of sits there, creates electricity. So these are the sources. Uh, the, the problem we, we have with them is intermittency. Uh, if we want light in this country, in most countries, most places, if we want light, we want it now. We want to hit the, of course it took three seconds, but we want to hit a switch and want it to work. So we want that on-demand energy all the time. 
And that is, that is the goal for most setups, on-demand energy. We want it, we want it now. That, that, that could be the source of problems because if we turn on the lights and there's not enough electricity produced, or we go to turn on the lights, there's not enough electricity produced, we don't get it. The way our grid operates in the U.S. is we have a base load, and then we have grid operators that say, hey, energy consumption is going above the base load, so we need to have our reserve power start to produce. So we have grid operations, grid structure, grid authority that says who can produce and who can put into the grid at what point in time. But in, in, in all cases, we can't rely on, say, solar as our base load because that base load has to be going all the time, has to be produced all the time, and the wind's not blowing all the time, the sun's not blowing, or shining all the time. So you need a place to store it, like these lights, these uh, landscaping lights, each come with a small battery. So these small solar cells here power that battery throughout the day, and then that photoresistor senses it's night out and turns the light on, nice and simple. That's a tiny scale. However, if you want to power a town, you're going to need a much larger battery bank, much larger cells, much, much larger array of, of all of this. But that's a backup. And if you don't have that, you need something else. Whether it's stored water up at a certain height, so you can use that water when you need it on demand. Uh, there's also compressed air. Some people are storing power through compressed air. So they have underground salt wells that they've sprayed a liner in and compressed air in it, and now they can release that power generator off that. So there's some sort of backup to this intermittency. Now, the sun doesn't just quit shining like that. You have some lead up to it. So that ramp up power, if you need that, say you had a, a water tank that you stored to power a generator you have an opportunity to turn that on and ramp that up and get it going. That kind of, the same with the wind. The wind doesn't blow all day long and then just stop. No matter what movies you've seen, there is a period of time that it slows down. So, but you do need a backup. If you're gonna rely on an intermittent power source, you need a backup. And this is some general stuff I'm telling you, very general. So our sources of electricity, what we have here, the fossil fuels, nuclear, hydro, biomass, wind and solar. Wind and solar are the ones that are not on demand. They're not ready to go all the time. Or not, it can't be managed that way. Any of these, you could say, well, we didn't, we didn't restock. We didn't bring our supply of fuel back in. So your power plant could be down effectively because you didn't supply that. You didn't prepare for that. So you don't have exactly what you need. All right, so that was energy. That was real quick. That was crude, quick, boom. Sustainable development. Start off, energy and sustainable development. Yes, sir. There we go. Uh, so uh, for us, or today, we're gonna look at energy and sustainable development with the idea of an underprivileged area. Uh, in this case, we're gonna be talking about Haiti at one point. Uh, so, as we as we talk about this, think of uh, think of some of the needs as you're as you're hearing me speak a little bit and what's going to happen. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. Uh huh. No, you, you need a certain ramp up. This would be your base load. And the grid authority says, uh, this plant, this plant, this plant, this plant, you have to produce a certain amount of power at all times. So this base load demand is met. That's what's always produced no matter what. And if, uh, say, the draw, that, that draw of power, what we're consuming throughout the day, say this is midnight, and this is 6 a.m., this is noon, this is 6 p.m., and then midnight, we have a certain curve to it that's based on averages. So if you, if we dip below the baseline and then go up throughout the day and then dip back down, of course that's made up, then that grid has, 
has a certain expectation or what they normally expect based on the temperature and based on the day of the week and the hour of the day. So they can begin to predict it and say, hey, we have this spinning reserve that's ready to go like this. It's ready to hit, it's ready to draw anytime they need it. Yes and no. A spinning reserve, this first level of backup is going to be one that is synchronized with the grid and ready to go at any time, instantaneously. It's not putting power on the grid, otherwise there would be too much power being shoved out and no place to, to drop it. So they, they'll have like a power dump at their facility where they can, they're ready to go, but it's just being dumped. Maybe they're charging the ground. It's just being thrown away, effectively, but it's ready to go. So they'll say, hey, your spinning reserve, we need you ready to go at five in the morning. Five in the morning, we need you in spinning reserve and you go till 10 at night. And they're okay, that's when we operate. So they could be shut down. If you go by the stadium sometimes when it's nice and like a real mild day out, in the morning you see the lights at the stadium on. That's because it's dropped below the baseline, the actual consumption, because nobody has their air conditioner or heater on, because it's a good temperature but they still have to produce that baseline. So they'll use this big power dump, like the stadium, turn all these lights on, because it has to go somewhere. If you go past Bush Stadium or Soldier Field, pff, lights are on. Like, why are they wasting energy? Gotta be produced. That's it. They don't pay for that? Nope. Yeah, they are wasting it, but they aren't paying for it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, this is based over a long period of time, based on temperatures and what they predict and, and what historically has occurred and any, any growth. So there is. Basically, they are trying to follow some sort of economic stuff. So yeah, just yeah. They, the I mean, and you don't want your spinning reserves going for the, the, the hours between midnight and 6 a.m. when it's a, right. a mild day out, because you you're wasting even more, because generally you're going to be below the baseline, at base load. So it's a matter of of how responsive you are. And so a certain plant, say it's a coal plant, it could take an hour and a half, two hours to get that ramped up to a certain rate. That's not very responsive. But if you had a, like a solar farm that you can turn on like that, it takes three seconds to ramp up, you might want that in a spinning reserve. That, that's the terminology of spinning reserve so that you can say, hey, we need it now. Three seconds is a pretty good response rate. It's on, it's ready to go. So it's, it's, you have to look at responsiveness as well as the demand at the time. But unless, unless everybody synchronizes their watch and says, we're turning on our, our machines today at 8 a.m., there, there's just not that massive draw. And, and in the case there is, you get a brownout where you get a voltage drop and lights dim. Like if you turn on a, a, a washer in an old house, that type of thing, or a dryer, it, it dims for half a second. And so it's, a, it's that same idea, but just on a larger scale. But there is a responsiveness and they are ready to go. If that spinning reserve begins to be almost at capacity, then they go into a non-spinning reserve where it could be a, a hydro plant, like a small hydro plant around here. Generally, those don't operate except in August because they have to go up to that non-spinning reserve, something that's not ready to go, but has a good response rate and in most cases, those things may operate two, three weeks out of the entire year, but what they would have had to pay in, in fees for not producing, not meeting that native load demand, would have been more expensive than just paying for that to sit there all year. So it's, it's, it's worth their time and, and energy to do that. Right, more questions on, on energy? I, I know it's very crude and it's very, very rough here. They're, they're very costly. And, and if you look at storage now, in a place like Illinois, uh, out west you may have storage where you can pump water up a hill. So you have what, is, what was mass at a certain level, you've increased its height, so you have potential energy. If you do that here, you have to build that structure to hold water up and to hold water of substantial volume up 200 yards just is not economically feasible. Or so you can look at batteries. If you store things in batteries, you have these batteries that how, how often are they going to be used? And battery life, the more you drain it 
and charge it and drain it and charge it, the shorter their life is. So you have these batteries that are very expensive compared to what they actually give you, and it just doesn't put out much for, for a, a, a capacity like uh, the U.S. demands. We, we, we want our energy now. We're going to suck more out. We just keep going. Uh, we turned the light off, so we saved energy. Really? <laughs> Got your AC cranked up to 60 degrees, yeah, and you're saving energy, that kind of thing. So it's, for the U.S. right now, uh, it, you could have capacitors. You have uh, a capacitor banks, and you have battery banks at some power plants, and they may be required to have one megawatt capacity, where they can, if they have to switch generators, those capacitors are right there to make sure that switch is seamless. So they go from one generator to the next. Say they need to do maintenance on one, or they're turning one down. But boom, right there, they have their capacitor bank seamless. There's no blink in the power. Or they have a one megawatt, which who knows how many amp hours it could be, but effectively one megawatt power for an hour out of a battery bank just in case everything goes down because they don't want to pay the, the penalties for not producing, particularly if they're a baseload plant. The, the penalties for that just are phenomenal. If, if you, they get a bunch of calls at the grid authority because people didn't, couldn't watch Dr. Phil's special at night, then you know, all of a sudden the, the costs just go through the roof. And, and they have a lot of leeway in what they can charge. So it ends up being quite a bit. So are we, do we, am I delivering that well enough that you kind of understand what I'm talking about? With intermittency and on demand and a little bit of the storage, so switching gears a bit, sustainable development. And I, and I stumble over my mouth quite a bit when I say this, but the development of a community, that, that could be a town, city, neighborhood, a, a small country, any of that, to a method where resources can be managed so that consumption is less than replenishment. So say you have your uh, stores of corn, grain corn. Every year you produce a certain amount in that area. If you are going to sustainably manage your corn reserves, you have to not eat more than you produce. Right? So it's it's just a simple ideal and and that's what we kind of mean by sustainable development, and not just corn itself, but the entire community. Right? So you aren't looking at just the food. I mean, you're looking at those resources that could be the natural resources whether it's water, clean water, food, agricultural land, uh, forest land, any of that could be the natural resources, but you could also be looking at the human resources. How do you keep that in a neighborhood? Some, some uh, poorer countries have what is called a brain drain, where they send their educated or their uh, college graduates out to the U.S. or to Britain or to a variety of places, and they get an education, and then they don't go back to their country. So the, the brain drain, this education, now leaves the country, and who do they have to come back and educate their own people? So a brain drain does occur in certain areas, which some visas are used to, to alter that a little bit. But if you don't have those skills, the appropriate skills and education for that community to help maintain that development, it disappears. It goes away. Or it, it doesn't actually sustain itself is a better way of saying it. All right, so renewable resources. This is just some terminology here. A renewable resource is a natural resource that replenishes itself through a natural process in a reasonable period of time. It's kind of vague, but there's not a whole lot better way to say it. Because you could say, you could argue that coal is a natural or a renewable resource because without that reasonable period of time, yes, it does replenish itself through a natural process. However, as far as we are concerned in our window of time, in our life, in our great-grandchildren's lives, and in their grandchildren's lives, it's not within a reasonable period of time. It takes millions of years, not a year, not a season, not two years, not ten years to bring back agriculture or topsoil. It's nothing like that. It's, it's going to be gone before 
at, at a certain rate, it's going to be gone before we can bring it back. And it has to be a natural process. We could, we could synthesize certain chemicals, so on and so forth, but if it doesn't bring itself back through a natural process, we don't really call it a renewable resource. Now that goes along with a sustainable resource. A sustainable resource is different from a natural resource in that all sustainable resources are renewable, but not all renewable resources are sustainable. You don't have to go far to see it. All right, a, a sustainable resource is one that one managed properly, the consumption is outweighed by the, the growth. So it continues to grow more. So if we look at forest land in the US, if we're looking purely at forest land in the United States, is that sustainable the way we manage it? Just a guess. Seems like it. It, it. it didn't used to be. If you go back 100 years ago, it was not. It was clear cut, go to the next place. Clear cut, go to the next place. Or clear cut and put in farmland. Clear cut, put in farmland. Now we have almost twice as much forest land as we did over 100 years ago. So we do have a lot more growth. Growth now is a third of the harvest. So using the appropriate techniques, we can manage that forest resource and still have growth. So we have more timber growth than we have harvest in the U.S. That does not occur everywhere, of course. You go to the tropics, most tropical locations, the harvest exceeds the, the growth by a large margin. So that renewable resource is not being sustainably managed. It's not a sustainable resource in that location. Here it is. Trees are obviously renewable. Trees grow back. You don't have to plant trees for them to grow. I'm not saying don't plant trees, but they grow back. The seeds are there. The seed bank is there. They will grow back. Or some of them that are already growing, you cut the other trees, all of a sudden they have more light and they can grow faster. So they do grow back, but if you don't manage it appropriately, you can wipe out areas of forest. That's just the way it is. So that's the difference between a sustainable and a natural resource. So another one, appropriate technology. That is a, a technology that is designed with a special consideration to environmental, ethical, cultural, social, and economic implications or impacts. So if we go to a, a economically devastated area and we just start handing them computers, say here, I mean, you can get on the internet. What does that mean to them? Nothing. Yeah, I, it, they're being motivated by what do I eat tomorrow? What do I eat tonight? So uh, great, you gave me a computer. Wonderful. Is that appropriate? Is that necessary at the time? You have to build up to it. It doesn't mean it can't be, but it's not necessarily appropriate at the time. Here's, here's one example of a appropriate technology where you have plastic barrels so people can roll water instead of putting a five gallon bucket on their head. If they have to spend all day walking to get water with five gallons, now they can roll 30 gallons. You have to go every other day or every three, four days instead of every single day and spend all day doing it. So it's a, it's a lot, it's appropriate because it meets their needs. It considers the cultural and economic implications. Environmentally, what about that? We're, we're, it's effectively recycling something. Instead of this being burnt or going into a landfill, now it's being recycled. And, and so it is taking into that consideration all of these impacts. All right. uh, what about cell phone use in, in Africa? You've heard of that? The cell phone use in Africa is growing exponentially. They expect to have, I think, over a billion phone lines in the next few years. Cellular phone lines in Africa. So you, you can easily you can go, go anywhere online. You can find a picture of a goat herder with a cell phone. Is that appropriate? Yeah. If they're, if they're putting in a phone system, why put in outdated technology? Why put in landlines everywhere? Why waste your time with that? Put what's appropriate now. Teach somebody how to use a phone. Do they have to have, understand RF currents and, and, and all this? No. That, yeah. look, at, look at our country. Shoot. How many people have a clue about that? You don't need to understand it. Show me how to use the phone. You're ready to go. Right. So you don't necessarily need to do that. Does that mean you don't need to have somebody there to fix it? 
when it breaks, no, because it'll still break. It's a cellular world. You have to fix it still. So some things are appropriate within reason. If you didn't have anybody there to fix it, what, were the, what would be the economic implications of cell phone use in Africa? You just built a tower. You built the antenna. You installed it. You gave all these people these phones. Nobody's there to fix it. Now all of a sudden you have to ship somebody from, from Europe or from the U.S. to go fix that. It's going to cost them five times as much. It's no longer appropriate because the economic impacts are too great. Yes, sir? Could that potentially be a problem? Potentially, but based on, on uh, cellular maintenance here, I, can, I would guess it would be considerably cheaper where safety standards are a bit different. But that's only having hung underneath one myself, but it's fun. Anyway, so here, here's the case. Here's a case I want your feedback on, because uh, Dr. Bobby told me this was a, a brilliant class. Good insight. Great. He said, raise, raise the bar. He said, Slavin, if your bar is normally here, you need to bring it up here for this class. I said, all right. I said, I'll, I'll raise the bar. So we're, we're going to talk about a small town. I don't have the town name. I can't remember it. So we're going to talk about a small town in Haiti. Small community, say 500 people. Uh, no access to a reliable grid connection. So the electricity is not a reliable thing at this point in time. It has a mountain stream near the town. It's very limited forest resources. So firewood is not really an option in most cases. In fact, in Haiti, a lot of the forest resources are already cut down so they can make charcoal for cooking. Well, did too fast. Now you don't have enough forest resources to replenish that. So it wasn't sustainably managed. Uh, the mountain stream nearby could have opportunities for what? Since you have a fluid moving, you could have opportunities for hydropower. Are you going to have a giant dam and back all this up? No, probably not. There's a thing called micro hydro, where it's a small generators are powered by this rather than the large ones. You don't need quite the volume. Uh, and no reliable access to a, a grid. That, is, that would be an electrical grid. No reliable access. So the questions are, what are your goals for the sustainable development in this town? That's taking into consideration they may need electricity. Maybe they don't. Maybe forcing electricity on this community is not necessary. There, there are plenty of communities across the world that still live and succeed, live successfully, effectively in the Stone Age. That, that's, I don't mean that derogatorily, but they live successfully, just fine. So do they need it? So if you're looking at the appropriate technologies, are you addressing the social and cultural implications of that? And then how do you achieve these goals and then what priority? How are you going to address those needs and how do you prioritize them? Are you, are you looking at, is, is disease a problem? Waterborne diseases? Is cholera and dysentery? Is that an issue? If it is, maybe, maybe clean water is a, a, a better priority. How are you going to clean the water? Are you going to use a filtration and carbon-based system? Are you going to boil it? If you're going to boil it, how are you going to boil it? Or if you're going to have these systems where you pump it through a filters, how are you going to pump it? Do you need electricity for that? Or can you have kids on a pump all day? Or make a bicycle, hook that up to a pump? Is it possible? How do you plan to do that? And then what other considerations must be addressed? Is it a, is a economic one? Is it a cultural one? More often than not, in economically devastated areas, there's a lot of theft. So if you have this set up, it's nice and neat, is it going to stay there? It is definitely something to address. Also, how are you going to keep it going? Say you're there for a project. You've got a two-year window to set this up, get it going, build this community. Are you going to train people? If you're going to train them, on what are you going to train them? Are you going to train them how to manage electricity, how to manage a, a solar bank that they've set up? Hot water, 
What, 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 what are you doing? What are your goals? So get with a few people. Talk. See. Address these first set of questions, but keep in mind the following questions. See what's there. What are your goals for the town? When we, when we agree on the goals, or a few of the goals, and a few priorities, then we'll say, okay, how are we going to do it? Because this is something to consider. You have groups going down all the time to Haiti, Honduras, Africa, a variety of places, have this great idea, and they hand things out, and here you go. You gave somebody a fish for the day. You have to train them how to fish. You, that's the goal of sustainable development. You want them to be able to take care of themselves. How do you do that culturally, economically, socially, and ethically? How do you address all those? So think of the small town. You don't know all the details, so you can't say, well, likely they're being made sick from the water. Or the water's fine. They're used to dealing with bad water. It could be the case. So conjecture a little bit, and then we'll talk, and we'll come up with some priorities as, as a group here. Yeah, you can write them down or shout them out, however you want. I mean, you're not going to turn them in if that's what you're asking. <laughs> All right, Bruce. <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. So we could bring some type of solar, solar panels. Um,
then we use so, yeah, we use solar energy to purify those All right, does somebody want to help us out with a goal? What kind of goals do you have? Rainwater harvesting. Rainwater harvesting, excellent. Rain is a resource. What is the environment like in Haiti? You, uh, like the climate? Yeah. It's Caribbean, so hot. Generally, in about anything can grow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you get substantial. Any other goals? Any other ideas? Anything you want to throw out there? What's the purpose of the rainwater harvest? We can use that uh, water in our daily resources. Our daily resource. Yeah. Generally, rainwater is pretty clean. Unless there's a lot of industry right there that's creating some sort of acid rain scenario, which there's likely not. If it was a heavy industry, it'd probably be a little more developed. So, rainwater harvesting, going to be relatively clean water. Depending how you harvest it, if you if you put it on an oily roof and collect it, and it may not be. Yes, sir. Um, we were thinking of because there's uh, there's streams and whatnot nearby setting up a pipe system. All right. That flows water down uh, to a I guess a solar solar plant that we make. We, we train the uh, train the people in town to do specific jobs in the in the um, plant. So you, you would have a, a solar uh, refinery for your, or a solar filtration type thing? Yeah, well, Cleaning. Yeah. All right, I see what you mean. Uh, What are some of the issues you might have with that? It, it is a little bit complex. What if you don't have enough water? What if this stream's going through here and you get into a water rights issue? Somebody downstream isn't getting enough water. Is that possible? Yeah. You're gonna have a rainy season and a dry season, generally. And the dry season was when you need more water and that's when you're getting less water from the stream itself. And so it could turn into a cultural issue or a, a social issue where there's some infighting because somebody's not getting all the water he or she thinks he needs. It's possible. So in the process, that has to be addressed, right? All right, what else do we have?
That's a good question. If there's a mountain stream there, I would say there's probably water under the ground somewhere. But how far? It'd be hard to say. So a possibility of drilling. What can you do with that? tap into your underground aquifers and you can get relatively clean water from that. Of course you should test it first or occasionally make sure there's not too many sulfides or anything in there that are going to cause a problem or any heavy metals that may have leached through there. Yes sir. All right, so the, the method for boiling is a bit up in the air. But right. you want to... So it would be something to examine anyway. What else do we have? What kind of goals? We can put up some solar cells and store the energy and use it for a source of energy. What can you do with that, with that stored energy? What are the priorities for electricity? Say again? Yeah, very, very limited. <coughs> However, if we're, if we're looking at these other goals, such as uh, potable drinking water or boiling water, I, I, I boil water on a hot plate occasionally. Right? You can boil water on an electric stove. Right, back here first, I think. So you mean more like a, a solar hot water and create steam and then recycle that? Yeah. More like a sterling process? Yeah. That's possible to, to set that up, yeah? Sure. Well, you, an outside group is coming in and working with this community, okay. and then the community should then be able to take it on their own. Okay, so it, it's, it's kind of a, a helping hand type thing, not a handout. Okay. All right, so what other, what other priorities or goals do we have? We said clean water, right? <laughs> Cooking heat. Anything else? Yeah, so uh, immediate concerns would be those physiological needs. So some of the health issues.
Yes. Bicycles. Bicycles? What are we going to do with the bicycles? Um, transportation. Well, these are, uh, these are more in the, the ideas on what methods are we going to use to get there. So it's, it's bicycles for <laughs> transportation or... <laughs> Yeah, you put you put a basket on a bike, you can carry a lot of rice in it, yeah. right? So, it, yeah, they need a way to get to and from places. But if we're looking at the general outline of what we need, first, want health issues, the immediate ones, the ones where somebody is sick now type things. At the same time, we're looking at clean water and cooking heat, right? Anything else? Do they need light? Yeah, they could could be substandard. What if you get there and you're like, whoa, nobody's got a roof over their head. Do your priorities change a bit? Yeah, there's some certain needs we have as humans that once those are taken care of, now we can look at things otherwise. You've heard of Maslow's hierarchy of motivation? Physiological needs, that's the first one. Safety and physiological needs, right there. They don't feel safe. Are we being attacked? <laughs> the red coats are coming. <laughs> so, so if we don't have those things met, we can't we can't begin to think of how do we get to that next step? How do we develop ourselves? How do we think sustainably? Not not about the meal today, but about the meal a year from now. And that planning, if we can get to that stage where that planning is, then it's going to be easier to manage, easier for them to manage. So there are, are some challenges there. So we're looking at pretty much this one and this one right off the bat, right? What about clean water? Why might we put it lower in priority? Yeah. S somehow they found ways to adapt. That doesn't mean we should just totally ignore it, of course. But the more immediate need is the health issue and their safety. A storm comes. They don't want to be hit by a tree, that type of thing. Or if they're sick, their stomach hurts now, or they're, they have such horrible dysentery right now, something needs to be done now. I said, well, you'll be okay because we're going to have queen, clean water in the next month. Right? So it's, it's a priority. Sewage. Yeah, yeah, sanitation, sewage. Where does that fit? Is that an immediate one, or does that go with clean water? It's probably somewhere in between, because certain aspects of it are, well, we need to get this cleaned up. We need to find a, a good sanitation method, set up sanitation tanks, or uh, what do they call them, the septic tanks. Those are relatively easy to construct if you can do it. And so that part would be on down the road, but the more immediate one would be quit touching that. <laughs> Don't put that in your mouth. So that, that kind of education, simple education type thing, right? So, yeah, some of these things could be right at the front. Here, he's probably tied for first. I would say second and third, right? If we're going to, we can group these. What, what can we use from renewable energy to get there? Or any, any energy. Should we set up a big grid system where we can connect to Port-au-Prince and, and hope we have some reliable grid. Do you think Haiti has a, anywhere a very reliable grid? Yeah. Yeah, that, it's just not that reliable. Even if they had a steady supply of something, just the, the infrastructure is not there. So we go from what is a, a centralized energy production like we have in the U.S. And, and most of the developed world, as it were, where we have a big power plant, they take advantage of economy of scale, and they distribute that energy out. And they pass it out through these lines. In this case, you don't have that infrastructure. You can't get it there. So they have to produce their own. And you guys mentioned some of these things, such as solar electric with storage. What about wind? 
Could you get anything cheaply with that? Yeah, if, if the wind is there, you can do it. It depends on the turbine more than anything, but what are they doing anyway? I mean, if, if they were busy at a 60 hour a week job, which they may be, then maybe that's not the person to go to to be the mechanic for this. So that goes into some of these questions like what other considerations or how do we achieve these goals? We find those key personnel, those key people that can do that and maintain it. So what would be the advantage of a small wind generator, a homemade small wind generator versus a solar setup, a photovoltaic setup? Well, the solar is pretty passive. It just sits there. You plug it in, it's walk away for 10 years. Oh, yeah, it, it, I mean, wipe it off occasionally. If you get a bunch of crud on it, so the light can still get through. But the... If, if, well, and, um, I don't know if other seasons look like all the time, but if, if there's no sun, then it might be kind of consistent. Maybe not as consistent. If you had a combination of the two, if you had solar there and wind, when the sun's not shining, the wind's probably blowing, right? Yep. So we we have something that's more cost effective, yeah. more appropriate. Exactly. What you're, you're going to have to do anyway, if you're not reliable here. If you are able to get that grid connection there, wonderful, but you, you don't want to count on it necessarily. So yeah, we, if, we, if we get small or small generators, small wind generators that are homemade, then that empowers the people a little bit to have their hands on something, create something, and now they understand it. They understand how it went together. So by that process of making it, they're learning how it works. And it's done cheaply. It's done with waste. It's done with stuff that's already there. Or if you're going there taking things, you take a 200 watt solar panel for $500, then you need an inverter, then you need a charge controller if you're gonna have batteries, then you have to pay for batteries, which you're likely gonna have to do somehow anyway. But, or you can go there with a few motors and say, hey, let's go find some parts so we can build it, make this, and that's, that's a lot more appropriate. Taking a motor, taking it there, a generator, an alternator, motor, say here, we, here's the size blades we need, let's hook it up. Then if a blade, blade, blade breaks, the guy knows how to make another one. He's ready to go, he's ready to do another one. So it is a bit more appropriate when you consider the economic impacts, the social impacts, and how that's gonna work. Does that mean you shouldn't use solar? No, because you get some stagnant days where you have no wind, but that sun's a-blazing, right? It's ready to go. So you have a diverse setup. So what are you going to do with electricity? Can you address these needs? Clean cooking or cooking heat, clean water? Can we sanitize things or develop sewer systems? Can we go those routes? Yeah, if you have more electricity, it is easier. You don't need it to do that, but it's a lot easier. If you have a pump moving water for you, you can get higher volumes rather than somebody on, but with buckets throwing water around. The more you touch it, the more filthy it gets, that kind of thing. How about shelter? Does that help with shelter, electricity? Helps with the comfort, certainly, but also in the construction and the repair. It does help. If you have access to power tools, and the knowledge how to use them, you can repair things much more quickly in general. How about the health issues? Would electricity help with that? Or other methods where it would, cases it would? Yeah. 
If somebody's sick and needs attention throughout the day, it'd be nice to have a light on them. At night, if you can, instead of uh, somebody holding a flashlight, it'd be nice to turn on a lamp and, and have that service available to you. Doesn't necessarily need it all the time, but it'd be nice to have it. Tomorrow we'll talk about the next level, how to get the new resources and actually using different pieces of equipment and machinery. And I think you, one of your main goals would also have to be training and education. Too. Absolutely. Right. And th this goes into our next step. We have some of the goals here, which could be any of, any of these, in fact. But which ones are the best ones? Which ones are the ones that are going to, not necessarily the best ones, more readily meet our goal appropriately. How about rainwater harvesting? Is that good? Yeah. In general, if it rains, the stream's gonna be fuller, but you've also just cleaned up or picked up all of these things because of the bad sanitation and sewage, which inevitably is going to be there. It, it is, it takes a while for that to get out. You have Giardia in your water, it's just gonna be there a while, like it or not. So. Yeah, rainwater harvesting, clean water, it's good. It's more readily available. You can store it. You can store it up. You can store it on top of a roof or in a place where it gets collects heat. You have warm water for showers or cleaning. It's better, right? How about uh, water diverting? Can we get into irrigation and drinking, drinking water from that? Or we provide water. We have a more steady supply. Maybe we can do a micro hydro based on that. You don't need a whole lot. If you can divert it and keep it and then have a drop, you can have a micro hydro go for until you have no water. So yeah, it's possible. Drilling for water, do you want to do that? Yeah. How do you get the drill equipment there? Could, could we build a coal plant there? Yeah, you'd have to get the coal there. You'd have to get everything else there and, and build it and make it go and get it going. And yeah, you'd have to keep bringing that in. So this is this is different because, of course, it's not this major development. But do you have the roads to get a, a drill truck there? No, not necessarily. But if you're going through stone, and and who knows how long you have to go? Somehow you have to get a drill up there. And how do, you, how do you pay for it? Yeah, who pays for it? Do they have it available in Haiti? Or is I was just playing devil's advocate. No, well, no, it's, it's very it's a very good source. Is it actually available in Haiti? Likely there is a drill in Haiti somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. What kind of lead time do you have on that? What if your your resources are there for 3 weeks to help you get this set up? A group came for 3 weeks and now we're waiting for a truck and he decided he doesn't want to go today. Does that happen? Oh yeah. Yeah, what, what's the lead time now? A week? Yeah, count on 12. It, yeah, it, it, of course that happens, All right? So, yes, this would be nice, but one of those yell butt type things, right? How about boiling the water? How do we do that? Do we want to do it through the forest resources? We, we can combine these goals because if we're doing some other sort of electric setup, maybe we can get a 1500 watt heater so we can boil water now. Solar hot water ovens and stoves. Can we do that? Yeah, you could. Are there advantages there? If you're gonna create steam, though, condense it, now you have pure water. So there could be some advantages. What kind of setup does that take? Who's going to maintain it when you're gone? What happens if something breaks? Do they have a pump now? Do they have all that equipment, those release valves, everything else? What if one of those breaks? How do you do it? So it, it, it is a good idea. Can it be done with that appropriate technology? Because it will take some maintenance. If you have a solar panel there, a photovoltaic panel, and somebody breaks it, what happens? You can't tape it back together, even if it's clear tape. It, so you have, to, you have to have these plans and act, or at least have them thought out, or a way to protect it on some level. So 
These are thought out. So that's the next question. How do you achieve these goals? Let's look at uh, rainwater harvesting and uh, solar electric with some storage. And uh, let, let's look at those two just to keep it manageable for class discussion. So we have a barrel here. It could be a cistern barrel. How do we get water in here? If we just wait for water to collect here because of the rain. Oh, so we get, we get an inch of water in the bottom of this. Yeah, so we have to get a, a wider area, whether it's a, a tin roof, something, so we can now collect water. And here, here it goes into the bucket. What do we have to be concerned about with standing water? Mosquitoes. mosquitoes. So we have, to, we have to do it the right way, make sure it's covered so we don't have mosquito larvae growing in there. Then we have more health issues, right? So it, it could lead to more problems, so we have to control it somehow. What happens if something breaks? What are we going to go with? Are we going to go with the, the traditional rain barrel setup? What if something breaks? What could break in this? Or, or maybe not break, what could be an issue that develops? Using like metal tubing rust. Yeah, you could have the tubing rust out. Can you, can you go around that quickly or relatively quickly? Yeah, you, you, could, you could come up with something, right? Yeah, duct tape will work for just draining water. Yeah. How about uh, just yeah, any piece of metal tied on there? Yeah, if, if you're just diverting water, water goes downhill. Except if you're adding what? Now you've taken what was relatively clean water, you're adding all this stuff to it, now you have a filtration issue again. Is that clean water? Is that good enough to drink? Possibly. Or we have to go back to cleaning water and having some sort of setup. So let's say we have a solar electric and, uh, and a wind setup. So we have a pretty solar panel here, right? Set up and, and it's got some pattern to it. Solar panel. Hang on. Got to hold it up somewhere. All right plants around the base of it because they don't have weed eaters, right? So <laughs> there's our solar setup and we have a uh, wind generator hooked up. So what happens to these? What are the things we got to be concerned about? Theft. Theft, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, if you have something here that has a perceived value, what's going to happen to it? Because we, we may have this town of 500 people, and, and you have 495 of them have this buy-in. Say, yes, I'm going to do this. But that, those other five are saying, you know what? I'm going to let you do this. I'm going to wait till you get something here, and I'm going to take it to the next town and sell it. Does that happen? Yeah, all the time. Particularly when somebody's hungry. Their motivation changes. All of a sudden, they don't, they don't care about everybody else. They care about their belly and their kid's belly. It happens. So how do you guard this? Yeah, you put this nasty razor wire all over it, right? So nobody gets to it. I mean, it's something they consider. Maybe not razor wire. I don't know, I don't know how, how heavily you want to guard it. But you put something around there to protect it. Or you have, you demotivate people on some level. Or you have somebody guarded. You pay a little watchy to sit there for a while. Yes? Well, can somebody steal a rain barrel? How would, you, how would you steal a rain barrel? Say you have a 60 gallon barrel, how do you steal it? Drill a hole in the bottom, and drain it, so you get all the water out, and then you walk away with it. Because you can't pick it up, right? So if they drill a hole in the bottom, it's totally worthless. So there is an advantage to a rain barrel, if you can keep it clean, right? But yeah, this, you bring a, I, th I think to your point, if you bring a lot of this in right at the front, into this economically devastated community, all of a sudden, this perceived value is, is up and you've, you've tempted a good boy to do something bad, right? So, uh, yeah, you, you, you have to protect it. You have to do it correctly and timely. You have to get some buy-in. 
to, to get that. Does that mean it's always going to be secure if you do? No. There's people passing through all the time. Even if you got all 500 people here to swear in blood that they're not going to take it. It's likely going to happen. How about this, uh, a wind generator? Is that likely to be taken? It's going to be more difficult, but it's possible. They would have to climb up there or cut down your, your pole or something. But it's possible. Not as likely. What are the more likely components to be stolen? Yeah, if you have copper or if you have uh, an inverter down here. Inverters are expensive here. They're stolen in the U.S. The copper is stolen in the U.S. I spent at least a week this summer replacing copper on cell phone towers because people stole it. They, just, they, they steal it. That's what they do. So if somebody takes this, does this work anymore? Yeah, it still, it still produces. You just can't use it. Because everything else is, is AC and this is DC. So if you don't have that, yeah, out of luck. How about all the batteries? Somebody going to take those? Oh, yeah. Those will walk real well. What happens if somebody gets in there and tries to take them? Or even this inverter? Yeah, they have a pretty good chance of being shocked. So now you've brought something into the community that could create safety issues, kill people that are trying to get a meal. Is that, is that ethical? Or, or taking necessary precautions to prevent that? So something along the way. What else do we have with this, this type thing? What are we connecting all of this to? Say we have a small microgrid in the community, effectively. So you have this power produced, it goes through this setup, and you have effectively a breaker box, and it goes out to a few houses, however many it takes, right? And somebody has a small stovetop set up in their house now. Now that person is susceptible to theft, susceptible to that kind of crime, potentially violent crime, because they're trying to boil water or cook food. So some of those things, do you make it a more community-based thing? Do you make it a more individually-based thing? Make people work for it? I don't, in all honesty, I don't know enough about the Haitian culture to say, yes, it's more collective or it's more individualistic. But those considerations have to be thought of and at least not implemented so fast that you're making the wrong assumptions or assumptions that could be incidentally right but have the, the opportunity to be wrong. So how are you going to do this? Come up with a quick plan. T talk in that group. How are you going to do that? How are you going to prioritize on these items and what are they going to address? If you can come up with anything. If I haven't already talked too much. And don't forget the training and development aspect that was mentioned earlier. Whom are you going to train and on what? Did you need that back up? Oh, <laughs> sitting the button and I saw you looking at it.
All right, let's uh, let's talk about the issues. We had theft, safety, maintenance. Any other groups of issues with this? Because training really goes into all of these. Training and, and teaching them how to do this and how to manage it on their own goes into all of this. So how about theft? What are some proactive ways to address theft? I mean, the, the razor wire is a... It's a passive way, and it's not going to work all the time. Um, I think you can hire somebody that walks around like a neighborhood watch, uh -huh. um, and he's paid by a portion. He gives you have to give him a portion of your, you know, whatever you get. So um, maybe like ten percent of your water. If you can use the show or So you're, uh, you're having somebody, a variety of people, nobody can work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but you're paying these people to, you're incentivizing them effectively to, to get some sort of buy-in, either through the production or if it's the water, they, they have a constant supply of clean water or somebody helps them with that, right? Okay. Yeah, if, if uh, if there is a location, if there is a, a home in the vicinity that does have a fenced-in area or already existing fenced-in area where it's not easily accessible, yeah. Okay, electrify the fence. <laughs> that that would work. That that falls. Uh, even though it is a electrically active system, it, it still falls into a passive system. And uh, yeah, that doesn't incentivize uh, to not perform bad behaviors. But <laughs> if we're going to incentivize good behaviors, in this case, something somehow working with the community. So it's culturally relevant, something that will work with them. And you know, maybe, maybe you're there for a year and you realize the only, the only way they're going to respond is getting shocked. Now they won't do it. That's possible. I've, I've had some undergrad classes that I think that would be the only way to get them to pay attention. It, I can agree with that. <laughs> you have dogs? Well, it, that could easily turn into a, a, a hunting scenario. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like guard dogs up and you, you give them 
you know, things are going to bite you. You don't have any weapons. Well, I mean, machetes come come easily, yeah, though. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, we won't talk about the logistics of attack dogs, but yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, dogs or uh, the fence, other uh, negative incentives. <laughs> yeah, that, they'll fall under a negative incentive or. That we should call it a penalty, negative incentive or a penalty. So you you hop, you try climbing the fence, you get the penalty of being shocked. <laughs> yes. Well, a couple of words, like one way to keep people from your own community from harming them or stealing from them would be make sure everyone has some sort of shared benefit from it. Yeah, good. If you're benefiting from So in this case, we're we're offering a positive incentive, something that is is more, and, and this is really how you want to approach things with, with any community, whether it's this or a student body. First, provide them incentives for good behavior when that doesn't seem to work. Provide them penalties for bad behavior. <laughs> well, yeah, but it it doesn't provide any incentive for good behavior though. I could be bad elsewhere and still still not be shocked. That's that's a penalty for bad behavior. To to actually get that to that for that to be a part of my life, I have to commit a, a bad act. So <laughs> it would be a penalty for bad behavior. Yes, it, not doing bad is is a shade of gray of good. But uh, <laughs> it's like stepping on somebody's toe and it's like, hey, I didn't punch you in the face. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> all right. Any other methods to address theft? Well, also, kind of going along uh, with the idea of where you place it, if you're going to build something like a wind turbine, maybe don't build it on the outskirts of town, build it in the middle where it's more visible, or we're making any sort of noise around it. So, traffic so we have some sort of uh, uh, social incentive. Right. It's well, town. So, or it could be the social pressure or the fear of being caught. One of the two. Yeah, right. So the. Yeah. So. Yeah. More uh, location cells were determined. Right. What What goes along with this last one? The involvement from the community and the benefits. Do they Do they physically get some product out of it? Yep, yeah, you have some more eyes watching. How do you get them to buy in? If you go there and you give them this handout one day, is that enough? You educate them on the benefits. Yeah. It becomes a, a communication process. You have to educate them on why this is good for you. Otherwise, they're, they're waiting for their, their piece of the pie. Right? If, if they at least have something to look forward to, this does involve education. Or if you... Get to a point where training, learning something, as you as grad students know, is a way to improve yourself. So if they have that incentive at some point, not immediately, you're not going to go into a community where people are starving and say, hey, you, you want to train on how to maintain this wind generator? No. <laughs> that, that's, that's not your top priority. But at some point, right? But this education, right off the bat, yeah, we, it's not going to be immediate. But here are the perceived benefits, or the benefits that will be coming, right? Anything else on the theft side? How do we prevent that? If we can prevent the theft, in a lot of ways, we're going to prevent a lot of the safety issues associated with that, whether it's the electric fence. Uh, that could be a safety issue for somebody. <laughs> or trying to steal batteries that are energized and 
crossing those, creating an arc, so on and so forth. All these things could be potentially fatal for someone. All right, so maintenance. How do we maintain this? Not necessarily who goes up there with the lubrication can. How do we maintain this in the community? How does the community hold on to this and, and make it theirs? You kind of start here with the involvement from the community, right? What are we training them on? Or what are the next steps that this takes to? Or what aspects from this, specific aspects? Say, not everybody turn on your stove at the same time. There's not enough power, that kind of thing. Yeah. Data in the sense of information now, right? Not necessarily a, a graph on the whole thing, but yeah, this, this is all very similar here in the, in the training. So we are getting that buy-in. We are maintaining the buy-in because if we start to lose that, then all of a sudden they start to say, well, that's, that's not providing me with anything, but it might, I might be able to sell it. And so their attitude changes. What about uh, anything else? How about, how do we physically maintain it? Do we do we train one person? Do we, do we find a, a community I worked with in Honduras? We called him Juan Mechanico. Do we find Juan Mechanico and say, hey, here, here you're trained on everything, or they just assume he's trained on everything when he he really wasn't? But it was fun to watch sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, what if, what if he gets sick or leaves? Or he says, uh, uh, I got a chance to go somewhere else. See ya. Now what? You give him like little uh, booklets. Yeah. Yep. All right. No, you never know. They might have an IMAX there. I, I don't know. <laughs> Tra training. <laughs> for, uh, for several diverse... Or don't touch it, you can put your name in a sweepstakes for an iPad, right? Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> so you have several diverse and key personnel, or you train the teachers, that could be one. You train the teachers how to, how to work with this or how to work toward that. And this gives them also, as far as the schools go, it gives them a positive thing to work with rather than this idea out of a book now we can look at Ohm's Law as it applies here versus here's this book that was donated to us and is 10 years old and has pages ripped out and a bunch of highlights in it. So there's something a little more positive here. Uh, and that, that improves the buy-in for the community as well. One of the first examples I gave was, do you give them a laptop and say, here you go, congratulations. No, but this does provide the opportunity to work toward those type things. Maybe they don't have the uh, communication technology where they can get connected to the internet, but if they have the electricity and the power and other opportunities, they may be able to get to that point. So yeah, providing the next step along the way it's going to be a good way to do that. And, and that all involves training along the way. How do we teach them how to do this rather than go there, do it, I'm out of here, ta-da, right? Which, you know, that's most of my classes. It's like a magic trick when I talk, right? Also, it's your, an amazement. How does he wake up in the morning? Really? <laughs> 
What else we got for the maintenance of this whole thing? We need somebody to maintain the electric fence. That's a given. Uh, but <laughs> well, <laughs> in, a, in a sense. Uh, but, but what happens at some point in time, if you're going to have this set up and you have a battery backup, those batteries will die or they will lose their effect. It could be five years, it could be 10 years, but they will lose their effect. Now what? They're just out of luck? Yeah, they have to they have to look down the road because batteries are not cheap. Good deep cycle batteries for a, a 12 volt, 200 amp hour battery, which they would have to have multiple of these, maybe 20, 30 of these. If you have that, 30 of them times 100 bucks, where are you getting that money? So they need to have some sort of uh, community planning. So there would have to be some sort of nearly political system, but it would have to be an organizational system to organize a community. So they can begin to plan, how are we going to earn this money? How are we going to collectively get this money? Do the most consumers, the, the, the people who consume the most, do they pay into a greater? How do they get the money? Is there a source of income? That type of thing. So these are all things to consider along the way and how we get there. Is this all appropriate technology? It could be. You could think it is and you get to a so certain location and whoa, not gonna work. They do not like this. This thing scares them. There, there's a community in Africa that a man was convinced that the reason his cattle were dying was because of the wind generator in town, or his, his goats, actually. He had a large number of goats die, no matter how many times he said, it's this disease. It's like, nope, it's that thing. Now, all of a sudden, despite the veracity, the whole community is saying, we need to get that thing down. It's killing our goats. We didn't, we didn't have this disease until that thing was here. It's killing the goats. They're dying of insomnia. It's too loud. It, it occurs. So if you don't have that cultural buy-in, it may, maybe it's not going to work. So having a flexible plan along the way, how do we adapt? Thinking ahead, planning all this out step by step is great. However, now suppose this one doesn't work. What's it, how do we divert? How do we get around that? So it is a process. This is more of a thinking exercise or a food for thought exercise in anything, but could, as far as renewable energy goes, it gets a bad rap in the U.S. in a lot of cases. Ah, you can't rely on that for anything, but here's a great case for it. You're not connected to a grid. You have no other means of getting there. You cannot build a power plant for a community of 500. I shouldn't say you cannot. It's not economically feasible to build a power plant for 500 people. Something small like this, that could be just enough energy to boil the water you need for clean water for the community. Maybe, maybe that's the first step. Then that gives you something to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and keep walking, right?